Now, what we did is we talked about two of the five solid principles. Now, these have been presented at NI Week in several years in the previous, but trying to pack all five in had left people with a lot of just going, uh. So we decided to just reduce it down to just two of them and spend about a half hour on each one. And uh, that seemed to go pretty well last year, so this year we're going to tackle another two of them. So John's going to take the D at the end of solid, and I'm going to take the I. We're going to start with a quick run through of the uh, of all five. Now, for those of you who don't know what solid principles are, LabVIEW has as its goal: we want to make all of this massive amounts of computing power available to a bunch of folks who don't have the necessarily the CS training. It's our job as computer scientists working on LabVIEW and the few architects in the room to provide a way to channel some of that information down. And we can try as much as we can to put that power in your hand in a nice packaged form. But there comes a moment when you are writing software that gets big enough, scalable enough, or just weird enough that you need to understand what's really going under the hood and what constitutes really good software. So this series of lectures is intended to bring to you the table some of these concepts that a CS degree would have, would have brought to you, but in a form that's packaged down a little bit more manageable instead of a full semester course. So that's why the, the, the training is still occasionally necessary. SOLID is a set of five engineering principles that are absolutely, and in one case, provably impossible to achieve. These are ideals. These are utopian goals. They are designed to be held in mind while you're doing your design so that you can say, am I following SOLID? Am I consciously breaking SOLID? In general, if you consciously don't follow one of these principles, it's not necessarily bad. What it generally means is you're creating more work for yourself in the future if you need to go that direction. Frequently in business, that's perfectly acceptable because you don't expect your software to expand in a particular way or you don't expect to need a particular change. If you end up needing it, you regret not having done these things. You can never do them fully. That's one of the more interesting parts about them. These were codified in the early 2000s. Um, they've largely spread. Um, I've been kind of surprised that no one has tacked on a sixth in a, in a few years. These are kind of you know, the big bullet points to hold in your head when you're designing larger scale software. Um, when we're talking about these, we are talking about them at every single level of your design. When you're writing an individual function, i.e. a VI, when you're writing the modules that collect a set of VIs together, when you're designing the big sections of your multi-scalar, cross-platform, you know, targeted application, each one of these has that ramifications at every level of design. So what are they? Well, we're going to list them off, and these names don't mean much just by themselves, but you can, you know, you get used to them, but they're all polysyllabic here. You have a single responsibility principle, open and close principle, list out substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. As I said, each one of them is a pretty expansive topic, which is why we're going to break this down. So here is your one minute summary of each of the five. Single responsibility. Entities should have exactly one job. That job should be describable in a single sentence. The goal of holding to this principle is to make your, your code base learnable and maintainable. You bring a new person onto your staff, they need to understand what the parts of the system are. When they decide, oh, that thing needs to change, they need to be able to find the thing that's responsible for that, that change, so they can make the edits there. For classes specifically, and when I say classes, I also mean type defs and the functions that act on that type def, or however it is that you're packaging your data. At most, each class has one, two, or three primary methods. Things like do, start, stop, or set up, execute, tear down. They may have some ancillary support methods in order to do those things, but that's really what you're holding to. This single responsibility means when you write a VI, don't put a lot of extra frilly inputs for optional commands and stuff onto it unless they're really part of the core job. When you start getting a VI that's so big and doing so many things that you can't describe in a sentence, create the shove VIs, break it down into pieces that are manageable to swallow. Do the same thing at your module level all the way up. High-speed summary of open and closed principle. Entities should be open to extension but closed to modification. The goal is to reduce breaks in later versions and reduce retesting. Essentially, write your code so that you can plug in things or you can send it new data inputs and have it run differently so that in the future when you need different behavior out of it, you're changing the code around it, not the entity itself. 
That means writing very solid uh, parent classes and then inheriting from them in order to create an extension instead of piling all the functionality inside of a single class. That means writing a VI that has, instead of the functionality where an enum has got three different algorithms that are being selected, maybe consider passing in a VI refnum that is the algorithm you would like this thing to use as its core. Different options at different levels. Um, you want to, your, your design is so that after the first release, you don't have to modify the stuff you've already released, because that's well tested. You just want to have to test the new code as much as possible. You cannot close every module. You can only try to do so. There are some types of extensions that just simply will require rewrite of code. That's a fact of life. The more you focus on this, though, the fewer of those there are. Now, both of those are the ones we covered last year. Let's go substitution principle. Uh, I actually covered in my 2012 presentation. You guys are free to go find that uh, in the, the sessions. Inheriting entities must maintain parent invariance. Goal, an API that callers can trust to do what it says it does. When you write a parent class or a, you know, a parent API or some you know, framework environment, it makes certain promises to its callers. It says, I will always do this. I will never do this. If this happens, I will make sure that this, is a, this occurs. When you extend that framework, when you inherit that class, when you, you know, bring any sort of plugin into that entity, anything that the parent promised, the child has to keep doing. So if, the, if a parent says, I have an error wire that just passes through and I never generate an error, you can't override with a child that suddenly starts returning an error because your callers aren't expecting an error to ever come out of that dynamic dispatch node. That's an easy example. Um, there's a lot of other uh, pieces to this. My personal favorite summary, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck but it needs batteries, you probably have the wrong extraction. <laughs> it's not a duck. All right. Now, these are the two we're covering this week, this today. Interface segregation. Many context-specific APIs are better than one general-purpose API. Your goal is to reduce the ambiguity of parameters by having input specific to one client's needs. You, you don't want to have a lot of spare inputs that lots of people are using. This occurs frequently with your LV2-style globals, um, where you start piling everything onto the connector pane to support every possible method that you can call in. This leads to some problems with the, the unified interface. Um, it's the hardest to achieve in LabVIEW due to language li limits. We'll get into some of that as we as we go forward. You want to take this one? So this is the one John's going to be talking about today. Yeah, so the fancy inversion. Uh, big picture, depend upon abstract entities and not concrete entities. Uh, so to promote code reuse and to improve code testability, it's, uh, make your code modules decouple from each other in a nice way. So I'll go through and I'll show you some examples of how to do that. All right, that was eight minutes. That was our goal. That way we have big blocks of time for actually digging deep onto these guys. So as I say, we're gonna cover these two. And we're gonna begin the interface segregation principle. Informally, what this means, and I'm gonna slow down a little bit now, is that you only give clients what they're going to use. You guys know this just as you know, programmers who are delivering things to a client downstream. It is possible to deliver them more functionality than they're actually going to use, and sometimes that's a bad thing. You can result in a user interface that has so many widgets on it, they're not sure what to click on. You can give them functionality that you know, is actually destabilizing the rest of your code base, and they're never even going to be using that code. So you want to be aware of what your client is actually going to be doing with the, the stuff that you share with them. And when I say client in this context, I mean when you write a function, be aware of who's calling that function. When you create a class, beware of the framework that's going to be using that class. When you create a FPGA on a target, be aware of all of the callers that are going to be sending messages or pulling data from that FPGA. This applies at every layer of your software stack. Formally stated, you want to divide software interfaces into smaller chunks so that any given client of that interface gets only the chunk of functionality it will actually use. Now, when I started this, I, said, I, we, we, I told you about the, the single responsibility principle. And those of you who were here last year, remember an entity should have one and only one job. We are assuming that you've already created entities that are following the single responsibility principle. So you've got some API, and it's already nice and focused and on target. 
but there's still times when that nice and focused API is still too broad for some clients. So let's consider Q, the, the, the Q API. We can obtain a queue, we can destroy it. <coughs> in between, we can enqueue, we can dequeue. There's a few variations on enqueue and dequeue. All in all, this is a pretty good single responsibility API. It does one thing, it manages data going in, coming out. There's some argument to be made that perhaps enqueue at wrong end shouldn't be in here because that kind of uses it as a stack or you know, plays games with it. But overall, not a bad keeping on focus. Similarly, we've got this API over here for draw. For the most part, all of the functions are draw this specific thing, nice and packaged into different API operations. There's a little bit of weirdness of why the colored ones are in here, but there's a, you know, a support functionality that's at least related. Okay, we've got these nicely, reasonably on focus. Picture string and Q. Now let's consider what happens when we start offering too many options. The more variations of NQ that I put in the palettes, the more questions I get on the forums about what exactly is lossy NQ? Was it valuable functionality to a lot of people enough that we added it? Yes, but it does create confusion. When is it safe for me to use that NQ at other end? How many messages can I pack in and do I get myself in trouble using it? <coughs> the, as the options build up, there's more questions that have to be answered, there's more information that your clients have to use, and it's entirely possible that they abandon your library, which hurts your sales, or they spend a lot of time on your helpline, which hurts your, your bottom line, if you're spending time doing tech support instead of development, or they just flat get themselves in a really serious bind and now you're helping them debug their runtime stuff. And meanwhile, they're blaming you for the failure. Even, even when it's a user error, you created the need for a user error to occur. Absolute power corrupts. The more access that you give a client into a system, the more that they're going to exercise your system. If you have a database, you can give them a function that says, retrieve the names of users. And maybe they get a name of users. Or you could give them a function that is, give me a SQL query and I'll give you back a database result. You open up the full power of SQL to them, I guarantee somebody is going to start making assumptions about your formats and your data table structures, and they might even decide that they have the right to write data into your database, even though they're supposed to only be reading it. So you just opened up a can of worms. They will corrupt your system because you enabled them to get to have this massive amount of power over the system. And in fact, their one responsibility was supposed to be something very narrowly tailored. But client systems use what you give them, which leads to dependencies becoming dependents. They're, an they're a client. You're an API. You're publishing to them. They're going to use what you give them. If you start giving them an incredibly well-stocked fridge, they're going to assume that a well-stocked fridge is always available. And woe betide the developer who decides to go stop carrying Mountain Dew or whatever it is that there's their favorite drink. The well-stocked fridge may be an important part of your back-end system. It might be critical that this is stocked, but it's stocked for lots of different clients. It's this one nice place that keeps everything cold. But John, John only should be having a diet of nice, you know, raw protein. Some, some sort of caveman thing or something. <laughs> and I don't want him getting into the milk because he's allergic to milk or he'll do something weird with the milk, like use it for an art project. But he might, and then I'm out of milk when it comes time to provide milk to somebody else who actually needs it. Or milk becomes too expensive for me to stock and now John's API breaks. So these are analogies, but I hope you can imagine your own code, things you've written that provide a little too much resource. So let's consider the queues. With the actor framework, some of you have seen, we have two parallel systems. One system is going to be generating messages, the other is eating messages, consuming them. I could have just used a raw queue. Send the queues out to everybody. Here's the queue, you need to talk to this. But all of those entities really only should be enqueuing messages. That's all I want them doing. They're sending, they're senders of the messages. They're not managing the lifetime. 
good lord, we'd have whole systems breaking down if people could actually destroy the queues. We're really not wanting them to play with the ordering of the queue. That's the job of the receiver to decide priority of message handling. So I don't want them you know, playing with lossy or in queuing at the opposite end to try and simulate priority. But you might include those in a, in a sender-only system. But regardless, these are definitely operations that have no business being exposed. So the in queue loop, which is a client of the queue API, shouldn't have access. So what we can create is we have this project one way queue. I created an incure class. The incure class has in its private data just the queue ref node. The raw, nice, single responsibility queue API through this. But what's exposed in the public methods <coughs> is only an incure an incure BI and a write queue ref node that allows to set this up. Anybody that I give the incure class. They can't destroy the queue. They can't in queue at the wrong priority. They can't flush the queue and try to say, oh, I'm going to give priority to my messages over everybody else. Yes, I've seen that half done. Um, it limits the power of their ability to corrupt the system or to become dependent on high speed in, you know, high speeding and prioritizing their messages over others. Um, Kant's categorical imperative, that which I can do on my own, it's only moral if everyone could do it at once kind of holds true for APIs. One person in queuing at high speed and saying, oh, I get to have an advantage, works great. But as soon as two clients try to do it at the same time, now there's this fight for who's actually in control. You want to limit the API down. So I can take my obtain queue, and I've got a matching dequeuer class, and I can put the queue into an in queue and into a dequeuer, and I can send those classes into my producer and my consumer to clients. These guys are now using only the part of the API that I gave them. This result, and I am in control of the release queue. I'm doing the lifetime management on it. Does that make sense to everyone? Do you see why you might pare down an API to, to, to tie it down? OK. This sort of thing will crop up again when you start doing communication systems. Uh, you can imagine GPIB commands. It's in, common one that lots of people are familiar with, even though it's old technology. You have a device, it takes in strings. Usually a large manual full of strings that it can do. You're going to have various clients that are going to be talking to that GPIB device. You can just say, hey, call the send GPIB function and send it a bunch of strings. You figure out what strings you want, send them all down. Or you can say, client, tell me your needs. What are you wanting to do with my device that I have taken such care in setting up and I'm babying through all of the rest of the abuses of the system? You're going to tell me exactly what you do? Here's an API that does that and only that. Nothing more, nothing less. There's an advantage here. I give them an API that does that and only that, and someday I decide to get rid of my GPIB device and put in a PXI chassis or some other futuristic device. You know, there's a black hole at its core and you know speaks only Greek. His API, I fix up a little bit of API, and he doesn't know that he's talking to a raw GPIB device. I don't break him by changing this thing that's behind the scenes. I've kept him contained, and I keep the whole system running because I hid that nice private detail. As I said, we used this idea of the one-way queues in the actor framework. I created a priority queue class, which was actually a wrapper around the queues themselves in order to create priority structuring. And then I limited that even further by creating the incure. And that's what's shared out through the whole rest of the system. There's a matching dequeuer class. I hope there's no mechanism for you to get access to the dequeuer class. It's supposed to be completely behind the scenes of the actor framework. It's what allows an actor to pull messages out. It's public because you want to be able to create them all outside of the actor framework and it was useful to support. But there shouldn't be a way for you to ever ask an actor to get its dequeuer. That's totally private totally behind the scenes. I made the choice to create this even though I was inside my own framework. Why? Because I didn't want to make the mistake of accidentally calling DQ in a part of the code that I didn't think I had in my own design notes said should be doing DQ work. There, it, it kept me from making a mistake during the design process. So it's not just a benefit to the metaphorical other clients that are out there. Even within code you're designing yourself, you are both the API provider and the client. 
And that's sometimes the hardest one to think of about, you know, when you're trying to do these segregations. It's easy to think about segregation when there's another developer that you're exposing information to, because you don't trust those other developers, ever. <laughs> but you have to think of yourself as another developer that is equally untrustworthy from time to time. Or frequently. Now, when we start talking about interface segregation, Ideally, we would have this thing called interfaces, or mix-ins, or traits, or any of a number of here synonyms for them, that would go along with classes. LabVIEW does not have interfaces. I wish it did. I wanted it for a long time. There's some other developments getting in the way of us actually finishing that feature out. Thus, there's absolutely no point discussing them in this context. If anyone wants to have a philosophical conversation about how interfaces might help with interface segregation in the future, Feel free to talk to me afterward, but I'm going to leave it out of this conversation. If you know what interfaces are in other languages, please lobby your local field, <coughs> field sales engineer. It helps, get, it helps us get priority for feature development. So what I am going to focus on is something you can do in your own code in LabVIEW in G that does help with interface segregation. It's called the adapter pattern. This is a name that comes from other programming environments. Uh, was coined in what's called the Gang of Four book, Design Patterns is its actual title. You're going to create a wrapper class around the main class. Multiple wrappers may exist, each with its own interface. Each wrapper may inherit from different, different hierarchies. This is exactly what we just saw with the enqueuer and the dequeuer. So, to put it in a slightly different environment though, security permissions. The normal user interface got a nice UI, you know, you can click on things, is supposed to only allow editing of some fields of a record. <coughs> they want to be able to see those fields. The admin interface is going to allow editing of all of the fields. You can click on anything, you can make modifications. We're going to use user interface segregation to ensure that no one accidentally gives a normal user the ability to edit extra fields. So I'm going to flip over to LabVIEW here. Something close to it. So I'm going to run this as the user. And as a user, I can choose to edit. And I can come in here, and I, I, I can't fix that. I can come down here and say, fix that. So you know, my regular run-of-the-mill person on the phones answering user systems, they're able to change the email address. But we really don't want them messing with the, the, you know, the core last name, which is the key that we use throughout all the databases, and we need authenticated legal documents and stuff like that. So they can make that change. Then an admin can come along and edit, and he is actually able to make the last name changes after certifying that things are actually approved for, for such edits. Now, the difference between these two is pretty straightforward. We can either cause an admin UI or a user UI. Now, the user, the admin UI, takes this object in, and this customer record, he has full access to call modification functions to all of the names. You know, this this customer record. All of these different read and writes fully exposed. Every field is modifiable. And when whoever is writing this UI uh, VI has access to all of those methods. But the person who's writing the user UI is going to take in this other class, this restricted customer class. And the restricted customer class just has read and the ability to only write the email address. It's got these little small protected, or sorry, community scope functions for actually setting the customer into this object. So when I am writing this user UI, the thing that's coming in is an object that just simply doesn't even have the ability to make a mistake. 
So I can safely hand off the writing of this VI to another developer, and I know they're not going to accidentally not follow the design spec, because they just don't have the ability to call that function. I didn't put it in the API that I gave to them. Sure. They're unrelated. Yes, one is a wrapper around the other. There's no inheritance here, because inheriting would violate Liskov substitution principle. Let's review. Liskov substitution principle says anything a parent promises to do, a child has to be able to do. If I made restricted user inherit from, from customer, that would be a contract that says I have to be able to edit all the fields, because the parent promised it. So we're wanting something that clearly violates that relationship. You could, in theory, make it inherit the other way. Customer inheriting off of restricted, but that creates weirdness in who's actually storing the data fields. So at the end of the day, just making the wrapper is, more, is far more efficient. Does that make sense? OK. So we limit these things down, and now we, we cleanly have separ separated. This one has this rights. This one has a different set of rights. We can't, make, we can't possibly make mistakes during our actual coding session because the APIs just aren't available. That's one of those sanity checks that helps you make sure that you, what you planned out in your design actually gets translated into the code. How would your, um, this desire for interfaces in LabVIEW, how would that change that class hierarchy diagram, if at all? I want to go into that after this show. Okay. I mean, we don't have interfaces, and I, I really want to head that one off. It's a, that's a deeper dive than we have. Alright. So I included these slides just so you know you can look at them later as you're going through. Um, by value classes pose an extraction challenge. Uh, with by reference classes, there's no need to ever extract the wrapped class. So when I put a Q ref num into a class, into the wrapper class, I never need the ability to read the queue back out because I still have the ref num and any changes they made to the queue is just as good through the reference. If I'm handling data by a DVR or I have a DAC channel ref num or GPIB communications ref num, any of these things, or not ref num, but communication tag, any of those things, I never need to pull the data back out after the edit. With the by value class, I put the data into the wrapper and at some point later, I need to pull it back out. So, you're going to need a way to read that inner class. But if you make that read inner class public, you've just violated your own encapsulation because now your client API could call it. That's never good. So the fix for that is you place the read it back out function in a community scope and you make the, the caller API a friend, which is what I did in the, in, the, in the code there so that I could shove data in and I could take it out, but the guy under the hood couldn't. Does that make sense to everyone? Generally not, it's good. I need to see Ted actually Bob on this, otherwise I'll keep repeating it until I think you've got it. <laughs> um, I value classes do pose a simultaneous use challenge. This is true in uh, just about every domain, but it's, it's most interesting when you start talking about interface segregation. Suppose I have an object that is this Massive object can do lots of things. It's got, it's on target, but it's, it's still got a lot of moving parts to it. And I have a client that needs, mm, the classic example is, I have something that wants a clock as an input and a radio as an input. And I have this device that's a clock radio. I also have a bunch of things that are only clocks and a bunch of things that are only radios. If I've got a reference system, I can take my clock radio, cast it as both a clock and as a radio, and send it both in, and under the hood, it doesn't even know that it's talking to the same device simultaneously. With my value class, you can't make it act like both APIs at the same time, because you've only got one copy of the data. Um, that turns out not normally to be a problem, because most of the time when you're working with a by value system, you don't want to be operating on it more than once. It's just something to be aware of, that you might have to step out of the safety bounds of data flow if you actually find yourself truly needing to use simultaneous interfaces. I mention it here mostly so that you're aware that there is an issue there and you come ask me on the forums if it ever comes up or somebody. 
Um, you want to interface with methods, not fields. One of the problems we have with a type def is the fields are directly exposed. If you create a cluster and you send the cluster around, people can just directly access those things. And now any attempt to adjust the definition, it, you're, you, you really don't have a good, clean way of changing that data behind the scenes and still preserving the call that, they come, that they're using. So anytime you start practicing this, you want to find some way to seal up your data as much as possible and have them come in through some sort of other access. So if you're a person who doesn't use classes at all, and you don't want to be creating one of these class wrappers to provide the API, one trick you can do is just hide the data in a variant. Don't tell them what data you've actually stuck in the variant. Just give them an API to call that takes a variant as an input. Now that loses you some type safety, but it does make sure that they can only do so much. It's kind of, kind of useful. Um, keep it in mind as a general rule whenever you're trying to expose these systems and try to find ways that limit the access to the actual raw field. Um, and as a general thing, if you're writing things that are large enough scale where this is really becoming an issue, take the extra 24 hours and go learn classes and then be able to build a basic class wrapper to limit the access to the clusters. It will pay off very quickly if you're in anything that is of scale. So, summing up the interface segregation principle, we want to split large APIs into manageable chunks and we want to let the module needs drive those API divisions. So make sure you talk to your clients, and sometimes that's yourself in the other role. Find out what it is each section of the code actually needs to do, and only give them those chunks. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. That, in a nutshell, is the interface segregation principle. So, John, I'll let you take it from there. <coughs> no. You guys hear me if I talk loud like this? Good? You can hear? All right. <laughs> if I get too quiet, let me know. I to do that. Uh, so real quick, um, who here uses LabVIEW? Which hands up. <laughs> who here uses objects in LabVIEW classes? Fantastic. Actor framework. Nice. This is good. This is the right target audience. So, Dependency version principle. Uh, depend upon abstract entities, not concrete entities. Let's talk about what that means. So, the formal definition of this principle has two parts. Part A is the one that makes the most sense. Part B is a little more abstract. Part A says high level modules should not depend on low level modules, both should depend on abstractions. Part B says abstraction should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. And I think Part B is what gave me the most trouble. I'm going to do my best to explain it to you guys. Um, but I think it's either Part A is pretty simple once we get there. As we go, I'm going to talk about two different kinds of dependencies. Uh, so we have a runtime dependency, and that exists whenever two modules interact at runtime. Right? It's kind of self-explanatory. But think about data flow on a block diagram. Uh, the data flow dictates how these things happen on the block diagram. When uh, node A operates, then node B operates, and B takes an input from A, there's a runtime dependency between those two. So that defines how our software works to solve the problem we're writing this. The other type of dependency I'm going to talk about is source code dependencies. And those exist when a method or a VI defined by one module is called by another. Uh, that's when you look in your dependencies list in your project and you get VIs in there. Uh, because they're referenced somewhere up in your project. So there's the runtime, then there's the source code. And you may be thinking those are the same thing. I'm going to try to prove that they're not. <laughs> now, real quick, the demo. So I wrote a demo for this, and we're going to just kind of look at it and pro uh, progress it as we go. And I was thinking, what's the uh, best way to talk about an abstract idea? You've got to incorporate astrophysics. <laughs> so we wrote a little black hole time traveler's guide. Let me pull it up for you. <coughs> All right, so it is simple. The idea is we have a, a spaceship in orbit around a black hole. Uh, what can we find out about the black hole just based on our work? It turns out 
if you know your orbital circumference and your orbital period, you can find out quite a bit. Um, and so this node takes in the circumference. Make it big, make it period, make it small. If we run this, we can do things like calculate the mass of the black hole and solar masses, calculate the tidal force we'd feel if we were something like that in kilometers. It would have to be small. But how does it work? We look at the block diagram. Simple. Uh, just a producer consumer on top, we're uh, producing some data on the bottom, we're consuming it. Every operation is driven by a class. If, if you look, you'll see this uh, single responsibility principle in here. So there's a class dedicated to calculating mass, a class dedicated to calculating the tidal force, uh, the event horizon circumference, and limited time dilation as well. Why not? I'm going to really focus on the mass and the uh, tidal force in this, but all the mass is here is curious. Um, so if we look at the projects, we can see all of our classes here, and it turns out uh, the calculate mass class gets used on every other calculation. Right? So all these other classes are dependent upon a mass, uh, mass calculation. If we look at tidal force as an example, so we'll be dealing with that one quite a bit. We have one method, calculate tidal force, and on the block diagram, in this case, we've hard-coded our, our mass calculation. So we, are, we have a mass object there running the, the mass method because this operation needs it. Um, we'll get the on the demo, go back into the slides, so I don't get too far ahead of myself. But just so you're aware of what we're going to be looking at, it's going to be growing this code base to apply the dependency inversion to it and also turn it into an actor-oriented application. So that is the time travelers guide. This is our runtime dependency tree for that piece of code. So you can see all, everything points back down to calculate mass. The Black Hole Traveler's Guide is really just our top level UI that we interact with to drive everything else. And if I want to make other calculations, uh, these are how my dependencies work at runtime. The way it's written right now, what I just showed you, our source code dependency tree maps to my runtime dependency tree. That means I've had to hard code my mass objects into the block diagrams with calculations for all my other modules. Um, so if you think about the definition of dependency inversion, my high level module depends on my low level module, right? That's not what we're trying to strive for. So think of this as a code smell. If your runtime dependency tree and your source code dependency tree line up, then you're not doing dependency inversion. It's not necessarily a bad thing, like Stephen was saying. You don't always have to apply this, but it's Something to keep in mind as you're designing this stuff. So what we want to do is we want to break this dependency. I'm going to use some UML, just kind of quasi UML. Uh, I've learned UML as I've needed it, so it's on me from doing it wrong. But what this says is that calculate tidal forces depends on calculate mass. And that's not what we want to see. This is how I fix it. So we can create an abstraction around our, our calculate mass class. The abstraction is going to define the method, and then we can inherit uh, calculate mass from the abstraction. Now, if our calculate tidal forces depends on the abstraction, and this guy implements the abstraction, we're starting to see how we can invert our dependencies. I don't want to spoil the talk. So we're going to show something cool. So this gets us into demo part two, where we start to do this inversion. So notice I've created an abstract calculate mass class here. The code looks the same for the most part. Except for now, we're going to inject uh, the right type of mass calculation at runtime. And we'll talk a little bit more about dependency <coughs> injection uh, in the future, at the end of the slideshow. So I don't want to go into it too much, but we're using the factory pattern here in this case to uh, instantiate this object and pass it into our, our module. So the module doesn't really have to care how the mass is calculated. It just uses whatever type we pass in. So if we look now uh, at this, but this calculate mass is actually being called on the abstraction. You can't really see it, but that's my abstract mass method there, mass calculation method. And furthermore, if we dig into projects, and I open up my uh, tidal force calculator. It no longer has that mass object on its block diagram anymore. 
So notice how at runtime we pass a type of uh, calculate mass object in, and it operates on that type. So we're now starting to decouple our high-level module from our low-level module because they point to the dependent uh, the abstraction. And so we can apply that same principle to all the other classes, uh, the different types of calculations, to start to abstract that away. We jump back in. So now our UML looks like this. Our runtime dependency looks the same, right? Because at runtime, calculate tidal forces is still operating on some sort of calculate mass. Um, in fact, it's only got one, so it's using this one. So it doesn't use the abstraction at runtime. But in the source code, on the, on the actual block diagrams, my calculate tidal forces only knows about my abstract uh, calculate mass object. So what I've done is I've inverted the dependency. So this, the word inversion from the title dependency inversion is literally this. Right? The uh, dependency in the source code inverts the flow of control, which you see over here. So this is kind of a eureka moment for me because I've always talked about dependency inversion, but it never really sunk in what I was inverting. This is li literally what it is. So a quote from uh, yeah. Robert Martin, who wrote the, uh, the book which I'll you wrote a great book. <laughs> <laughs> dependencies are inverted whenever the source code dependencies oppose the direction of the flow of control. That's a really nice way to sum this up, and it's what I just showed you in UML. And he is a quirky guy. <laughs> yeah, I jump into the stone. Can't think of the name. But. So let's look at how dependency inversion allows us to build a single flow. This is an older version of the slideshow. We're not actually going to look at how to do this with PPL, so I didn't think I'd have time. But if you saw my demo in the expo, I did this, and I actually used PPLs uh, to drive an aggregate application, and it wouldn't have worked without dependency inversion. But I'll show you all the other stuff. All right. So let's turn this into an actor framework application. The reason I want to do this is because the actor framework presents us with an interesting way uh, to couple things, right? Because when we create a standard message class, that message class has a do method and a send method. And the way you communicate between actors is actor A calls the send from this class, and then actor B has a method inside do. So now they're coupled because of that message class. So how do we decouple these things? Um, let me show you a bit. If I run this, so it's going to pop up, ask me to inject my calculate mass actor. I just pick this one. So now I should be able to go and do some calculations. Pick the mass. How does it work? Same idea. If I go to my flat full time traveler's guide, open it back to core, there's our UI. Pretty simple producer consumer. So let's look down here. Let's actually walk through this, the flow of control. So we send a message to calculate tidal force actor, and we say, I want you to give me the tidal force based on these inputs. Uh, the tidal force actor needs to know the mass. So the first thing it does is it executes this request mass uh, method. The request mass method has to then launch, and this is how I just for this, launch a mass calculating actor, and then send it a message requesting the mass uh, to come back to it. And so we pass it in orbital circumference and orbital period. All this method is doing is calling uh, the calculate mass method of the mass actor. Fun project. We jump over to calculate tidal forces. And we have this guy here. So this guy's going to go, he's going to calculate the actual mass, and then he's going to send it back. <coughs> but what we're doing is we're sending it back to our launcher, but we have to be able to send it back to the right place, so we just send it back to caller, but we also have to be able to invoke the right do method. Uh, so we have to know and actually couple the tidal force actor to the mass actor in this way. So every new module that needs to calculate mass, I have to be able to hard code the, uh, the message class in there. So I'm now coupling the, my mass actor to every single module that needs it. Uh, so it's gonna mean I have to create more code, and I have to carry it around more places, Thing. 
So how do we avoid that? That's a good question. So we already saw that we can break source code dependency like this by creating the abstraction. But in the active framework, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, because we actually have to abstract away the message class as well. And so to do that, you can use a uh, little couple of messaging, which is actually in the white paper for using the active framework. Definitely the wrong slide. Just do that. I'm going to load up the right one real quick. So this is actually what's happening here. We have our calculate title forces actor. We're going to call the request to the mass method. And now we're going to actually call an abstract calculate mass message. So we've abstracted away the message classes. So notice that here we still have our abstraction around calculate mass, but it doesn't do us too much good with the active framework to abstract away calculate title forces the same way we did with the mass, because we have to get the data back. And if we use this abstraction, we're always going to be still hard coding a title force abstraction. We want to be able to send it back to title forces, event horizon circumference, black hole evaporation rates, time dilation, all these other things we want to know. And so I actually have to abstract away this message. And so what we've done is we've taken the AF message, we've created a, a child called low coupled message. The low coupled message uh, defines a send method and an address. So we can basically have a self address envelope. Then we can create abstractions that define data types. So we have an abstract calculate mass message. Up top we have an abstract return mass message. And then we implement that with the actual concrete do. So notice the send and the do are separated. So now when I have actor A talking to actor B, I have decoupled the communication. <coughs> because although actor A calls send and actor B calls do, they're not in the same class anymore. So we've decoupled our actors from each other which is a very valuable thing to do <coughs> if you want to use something like PPL to create plugins. You have to go through this. Any questions on this UML drop? There's a few little things in here. A few details I'll look at here. So if we zoom in on the abstraction on the message class, um, notice that one thing I didn't mention is we can insert or we can aggregate say, an abstract message as well, one of the data items of our abstract message class. So that when I send a message from actor A to B, I can actually pack a, a self-addressed envelope in that message itself. So if I send you a letter, inside the letter, or inside the envelope with my letter, I write my address on another envelope, put a stamp on it, <coughs> put it in the envelope, send it to you. So you don't have to know who I am, how to get in touch with me. You just put your letter back in the one I sent you, it comes back to me automatically. So that's the same idea here. So now I've decoupled the sender and the receiver, and then how the receiver gets data back to the sender. All right, so let's see what this looks like. application with abstracted message classes. So we have three abstractions around the message class. We have our low coupled message. Inside the low coupled message, we have a send method and an address <coughs> uh, message method. The send method literally just does this. It takes the enqueuer reference out and a priority, and it will enqueue this message class. This message the address message is simple, it's just an accessor. So we're just going to write that destination in. Then we created these two abstractions for the calculate mass. 
that any actor can call uh, to communicate with the calculated mass actor, and the return mass, which the mass actor can use to get data back to any actor. So we've decoupled those two from each other. So here, notice we have a return mass message object, the abstraction, inside the message class for calculating mass. This is my self-addressed envelope inside the message that I'm sending uh, to the mass actor. And here, we're just sending the mass back from solar masses. So let's look and see how this works. We go to the title force calculator, request mass. This is how our code shapes up. We are passing in our calculated mass still, so that's being loaded elsewhere, uh, either through some sort of a similar object, and I'm using injection, or just a factory pattern, however you want to do it. And then we're using that to drive the actual uh, calculated mass class that we load. It's in the message too. And then up here is our return message, so it's my self address message. It's a method that this, uh, that this class owns, and so we can send it right back. But it's kind of hard to read, at least from here. Um, but we have our self our address message method here. So that's owned by the little coupled message class. These are owned by the data def uh, definition class for the calculate mass abstraction. And then this is the send method for the little coupled message class. Notice that the calculate title force actor is entirely decoupled from the calculate mass actor because we've separated the message class to communicate with out into three different classes. And this only talks to the abstractions, not to the complete implementations. And on the return side, once we've calculated our mass, now this guy can blindly insert data into this abstraction and send it back. Simple as that. So now they are decoupled because we're able to invert those dependencies. Uh, dynamically loading dependencies, uh, I've talked a little bit about two ways dependency injection and the factory pattern. I use the factory pattern here just because it's uh, simple and easy to do. But I wanted to make a quick note that dependency injection is not dependency inversion. A lot of times you hear those two terms used interchangeably with their different ideas. Uh, we can use dependency injection while practicing dependency inversion to actually get our concrete classes inside of uh, the, uh, to override the abstractions that we uh, So in this case, an assembler object creates the dependencies and passes them in to the dependent objects that we want and Dimitri has done a few really good presentations on dependency inversion in general. Question? Yeah, hey, can you just back up the slide yes. for a second? Okay. That's all I need. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I would recommend everybody check out Dimitri's presentation. He gave it at CLA Summit in 2015, and he talks a bit about dependency injection and a lot of other really cool ideas. Let me get in the room right now. The factory method pattern, you saw this on one of my block diagrams. It looks like this. It's just a standard design pattern in the Gang of Four book that Stephen was talking about. It's a creational pattern. So this is a way for you to get uh, <coughs> objects into your uh, block diagrams at runtime. So in summary, uh, the abstraction part, uh, both high-level modules and low-level modules should depend on an abstraction. We saw this by extracting away the, the mass calculator to an abstraction. We broke that dependency and inverted it. The abstraction causes the direction of the source code dependency to be inverted in the direction of the runtime dependency. Kind of just a summary of what Bob Martin says. High level policy should not depend on low level detail. Low level detail should depend on high level policy. So what we're saying is the calculate title forces actor has a policy that it needs the, uh, the mass of the black hole to do its calculation. It doesn't care how that mass is calculated, and it doesn't want to care. So our low-level mass calculator implements that detail. A high-level policy doesn't care at all about the detail. It just wants that mass back, and it wants it in units of solar masses. And dynamic loading of concrete objects. A couple ways to do it. Dependency injection, or the factory method pattern, or two ways. A is the factory method pattern in this presentation. And there we go, questions. Got about one minute, um, but I, I think both you're, you're free after this presentation. Yeah.
So let's go ahead and bring this to a close. Uh, we'll ask a couple questions, and then we can go out to the table out here to free up this room. So let's go with just the two hands I saw here. Sure. So I'm a CLA and an OOP developer. I think the biggest question that I would want to bring up to the group here is what are the next steps? How do we, the people in this group, take this presentation and continue to learn on this? Because I'll be honest, I'm hungry. Lunch is about to be here. I haven't been able to digest all of this yet. Where do I go from here? Um, so that's a sort of an open question. We've been trying to find ways. This is sort of, uh, as he pointed you to Dimitri's presentation, which is a bit more meatier than what even we've got here. Um, we've got a few writings that have appeared up on various forums. We're sort of trying to generate that content. Uh, if you want to reach out to other textbooks type things, Bob Martin's book is an excellent one on software engineering. Um, and in general, uh, Wikipedia has an amazingly good computer science section. Topics in computer science, strangely enough, are one of the best documented there, and they go into a fair amount of detail on this stuff. What they sometimes miss is the why and some specific what the heck you're trying to get out of these things by doing all of this. Um, so you might also look to some testing resources to talk about um, mocking, M-O-C-K, um, for mock testing, doing in, yeah, so this is where it directly speaks to us, because systems test, can take huge advantage for performance and everything else by being able to do some of this dependency approach. So take a look at things that talk about mock testing and unit testing, such like that. And I saw a second hand here. So for dependency inversion specifically, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say it's justified to use that? Because it seems like a lot of coding to do for the layout. Is it, and you mentioned plugging quite a yep. bit too, so wouldn't you say it's justified to do that? So that's a really good question. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so you're saying dependency and inversion seems like a lot of work. And when should you do it and when shouldn't you do it? Um, I would say anytime you know your code is not static, uh, try to work on dependency and inversion. Uh, if you remember the very first thought I put up with the runtime dependencies and the source code dependencies and how they're one to one, that basically said, uh, it's going to be a lot of work for me to change uh, the way my mass calculation is done. I'm actually going to have to go through and touch my code in a couple of different places. So if change is a potential, you should focus on pretty much all of these solid principles. They all work together. There's a there's a specific use case. You remember his first demo where he had cal he replaced calculate mass with just this abstract calculate mass. Well, let's assume calculate mass took three days to compute because it was going off to some database or using some supercomputer that you need time on. But the calculate uh, the rest of the calculations that depended on it were pretty quick once you had that mass number. For your testing purposes, maybe you just want to create a calculate mass that returns a hard-coded number. You can easily inject that into your test system and do the hard testing on your, your core systems without having to worry about uh, you know, whether or not the core mass compute works. So when you've got flexibility, dynamism, those are the big areas. Plugins. Uh, if you want to send a lot of plugins, you have to do depends on the You don't need them all the time. You probably don't need them most of the time. But if you do need them, that's how you do it. All right, um, both of us will be available afterwards. We need to free up this room. Um, I hope that was useful. We'll talk to you tomorrow.